Our word this morning comes from the book of 2 Samuel. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me. The book of 2 Samuel, chapter 7. Now, much of the contents of this passage is repeated in 1 Chronicles, chapter 17. Actually, almost word for word. And this chapter describes what was possibly the best days in the life of David. He was king of Israel. The nation was united and at peace. David was enjoying a time of rest after all the problems and the troubles that he had to go through. For David, this was a time to meditate and to reflect on the blessings and the grace of God. And as David meditated, a dream was born in his heart. He wanted to build a permanent dwelling place, a house for the ark of God. You see, since the time of the tabernacle in the days of Moses, the presence of God had dwelt in a tent, a temporary tent that the people moved wherever, whenever they moved. And David dreamed of giving the Lord a proper, permanent place to manifest his glorious presence. But there was one problem with this. God said no. Now I'm sure that there are some here today who have heard the Lord say to you in your heart, no. Perhaps you have been aspiring to some new position on the job, but that has not come true for you. Perhaps you have been hoping to marry some person, but that does not seem to be going well. Perhaps you had a desire to be a preacher. You told God you were going to do it, but that has not worked out either. Perhaps you had a dream that you would go on a missionary field and do some great work for God. That doesn't seem to be working out for you either. Perhaps you had a dream in your heart that you were going to make a whole lot of money so you can give to others and give to the church. That doesn't seem to be working out either. It is as if, it is as if God is saying, that is not the plan I have for you. I want you to go in a different path. What do you do when God says no to your plans and your dreams? There are some here who will hear no to your future plans. And you're wondering, what is happening? I believe David shows us in this passage what we are supposed to do when God looks at our dreams and say, no, that is not my plan for you. And as we examine this chapter, I want us to consider some lessons that are taught here as I try to preach on the subject when God says no. Now, time doesn't permit me to read the entire chapter, but I trust you will do that on your own sometime. But I will touch on some of the verses that I want us to focus on. So if you have your Bibles with you, get to 2 Samuel chapter 7, and let's read. Beginning at verse 1. And it came to pass when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. Verse 3. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in thy heart, for the Lord is with thee. Verse 4. And it came to pass that night that the Lord, the word of the Lord came unto Nathan and said, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord. The exact wording in First Chronicles chapter 17 says, You shall not build me a house. This was a dream that David had in his heart to build a house for God. Yet God says, very night, you shall go and tell my servant David, you shall not build a house for me. 
I want you firstly to notice in these verses, it was a good desire. A good thing. David sat in his palace. He was guilty. He felt guilty that he was living in the lap of luxury while the presence of God, the ark, was dwelling in a tent. And David believed that the God of such glory as his God deserved a better place to dwell in. It was a good desire. And later on we would see in 2 Chronicles chapter 6 that God actually praised David for having such a desire in his heart. Hear the words of David himself as he related it to his son Solomon. Solomon is writing and he said, Now it was in the heart of David my father to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. But the Lord said to David my father, For as much as it was in thy heart to build a house for my name, thou didst well in that it was in thy heart. Let me digress to say this to you, church. This house, this church, and its grounds ought to look the best that it can be. Amen? The Lord's house does not have to be adorned with gold and silver, but it should testify to the world out there that the people who attend here think the word, the world of the Lord that they serve. Amen? When people visit our church inside and outside, what they see tells them what you and I think of the Lord. So we should be doing everything that we can to make sure the house of the Lord, the grounds outside, looks the best that it can ever be. Why? Because our God deserves the best. Amen? And how we treat this place reveals the depth of our commitment to the Lord. So it was a good desire. It was a gracious desire. David is not asking for anything at this point in time. His desire is to give to the Lord. He wants to give something back that the God who has given him everything, he wants to honor the Lord by giving back something to him. That ought to be the desire of every redeemed heart today. You see, you and I could never possibly repay God for what he has done for us, although he has not asked us to. But there should be a desire within our heart to honor God, to see him honored and glorified regardless of the cost. Verse 1 tells us that this resolve to build a temple or a house for God came when David sat in his house and the Lord had given him rest about from all of his enemies. You see, much prosperity had come to David at this time. He was the king. He had been successfully, uh, he, he encountered all his enemies and defeated them. And now was a time for him to sit in his palace in much comfort and peace. You see, prosperity really tests our character, doesn't it? It reveals quickly the type of person that is being prospered. Sometimes we think, that it is affliction that reveals our character. But not only does affliction reveal our character, affluence and prosperity does in a very, very same way. And unfortunately, not many people react as well as, diff as David when they become prosperous. Scripture gives us many such examples. We remember Neb Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the great uh, empire of Babylon, when he became prosperous, he said, is this not great Babylon that I have built for the house of my kingdom by the power of my might, for the honor of my majesty? We realize, remember what happens to him, right? You see, prosperity comes to us so that we can bless the Lord for it. We remember King Ahab when he was doing well. He went out and he started to covet forbidden property that resulted in the death of neighbor, the, the, the owner of the land. The rich man in one of Jesus' parables, when he became prosperous, hear what he said. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, 
and be merry. Prosperity often brings out the worst in people. But not so with David, this king. When David prospered, he did what? He did not become proud. He did not set in his heart fleshly indulgences. Instead, he wanted to honor the Lord. And what a good desire that is from us that when we become prosperous, that our goal in life would be that we would honor our God. What a most commendable way to use our prosperity. You see, that is why God gives it to us. So that we can bless and honor his name in turn. So are you using your blessings to bless the one who blessed you? It was a good desire and a gracious desire. But it was also a godly desire. David had no ulterior motives in wanting to build the Lord a house. His desire was to see the Lord glorified and honored. He wanted God to be exalted and he wanted the Lord to receive the glory and the honor he deserved. See, it's not a bad thing to have a dream. But I ask you, make sure your dream is from the Lord. Amen? When David had a good and gracious and godly dream, but it was not from God. He was even, notice, he was even encouraged by Nathan the prophet. Nathan says, go, do what is in thy heart, for the Lord, the Lord is with you. Apparently, David's dream had everything that earmarks, that, that, is, that, that seemed to impress that this, this dream in his heart was actually from God. Truth is, it was not from God. And thank God we have a dream and a desire to serve him. There is nothing wrong with having a dream, but we need to be sure that our dreams are from the Lord and that they are part of his plan for our lives. Joseph's dreams were all from the Lord and they all came true in time. But you and I, when we have dreams that are not from the Lord, they may well come to naught. But I want you now to notice the denial that, Joseph, that, that, that David experienced. When Nathan returned home, that very night, God spoke to him and told him to return to David and to tell him that this is not the dream of the Lord. God was saying to him that David's dream to build a house for the ark was, did not come from the Lord. It originated in the heart of David. The motives were right, but the dream was a man's dream. It was not God's dream. It was not God's plan. But when God says no to David, notice he does not shatter David's dream and leave him with a broken heart. As we read on in the chapter, and I ask you to do that on your own, you will see that God, when he said no to David, he tempered them, the no, the refusal, with some precious promises. And those are words that should help you and I you know what times when God says no to us? Notice, it was tempered by God's provisions. Instead of allowing David to give to him, God turned everything around and gave to David. God reminds him that in his great grace, he took him from the sheepfold and he made him into a king. God reminds David that in his grace, he took a nobody and he made him a somebody. Hallelujah. Verse 9 tells us, Gee, God said, I have made thee a great name like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Overnight, David become a celebrity. Everybody knows who David is. David is reminded that he has been made a partaker of God's rest, God's peace, God's victory, and God's power. Hallelujah. Notice also it was tempered by God's promises. David had a desire to build a house for the Lord. But God tells David, I am going to build you a house. Hallelujah. In verses 12 and 16, I ask you to read it. We see the terms of the Davidic kingdom being given, the covenant being given to David. God promises David that he will have a son. This son will walk with the Lord. And he will be treated like a son of God. 
He will be established in his kingdom and he will be chastened when necessary. God tells David that this son, this son is going to build me a house. Surely these promises were meant to give peace to the heart of the man to whom God was saying no. It was tempered by God's plans. God is saying, David, you want to build me a house, but I'm telling you that I'm going to build you a house and I'm going to establish your throne forever. What a promise. And so often the dreams that we have are not always God's plan for our lives. Sometimes God says no to our dream and our plans, but it is not to defeat and destroy us. He does it because he has something far better in store for you. Amen. David thought that he would build a temple and that would be the end of it. He found out that it was not God's will for him to build a temple. He also found out that God was had some things planned for him that he could never have imagined for himself. Why? Because God always has the better plan. But there is some deeper truth that I want us to see in this refusal of God to let David build a temple, build a ark. I want you to see that God's refusal was prompt. Look back at verse 4 with me. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan and told him, Go and say to my servant David, you shall not build a temple. The promptness of God to inform David that he could not build a house reminds us that God is always prompt when he has given us instructions. When we continue long in our disobedience, it's not God's fault. It is ours. When we have been on the wrong road for years, it indicates that we are not listening to God and we are not interested in what God has to say. When we choose to continue in our own ways, contrary to what the word of God reveals, through his word and through his ministers, it only shows our rebellion and our lack of trust. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, so he warns the wayward early. He is prompt in warning them. Repeatedly, God informed Israel that he had spoken to them early about their, will, their waywardness. We see this evidence time and time again in the book of Jeremiah. The Lord had sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not hearkened. No one will ever be able to excuse their sin on the basis that God was not prompt in informing them about their waywardness. God is always early in this matter. See also that God's refusal is plain. Go and tell my servant David, thus say the Lord, thou shalt not build me a house to dwell in. This language, the refusal is certainly plain and easy to understand. God is not only prompt in telling David he was not going to build the house. He was plain in telling him this information. When God warns men about their waywardness, he is always plain. It does not require a college education to understand this warning. God is, does not model and make vague and uncertain his instructions to us, church. Many people complain that the Bible is too difficult to understand. And they turn away from it. You know why? It's not because they do not understand it. It's because they don't like what they do understand. Mark Twain, the author, said it like this. He said, it is not the instructions in the word of God that bother me, not the ones that I do not, is the one that I do understand. And too many of us are like that. We turn away from God's word because we don't like what we are hearing. Important truth which we need most to know is always given to us in the plainest way in the Bible. But man, in his corruption, befuddle and muddle the plain instructions of God by bringing weird and crazy interpretations to us. 
And that only does not show just the difficulty. It doesn't show the difficulty of understanding scripture. It shows the intensity of man's rebellion and utter disregard for the plain teachings of God's word. God is early in this matter. Notice also that God's refusal was not just prompt and plain, it was proper. 1 Corinthians 22 tells us of this aspect of the refusal. David himself is telling Solomon, and he said, and Solomon writes, and David said to Solomon, my son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house unto the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, thou hast shed much abundant blood and has made great wars. Thou shalt not build a house unto my name because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. You see, David was a man of war and as a result, he had shed much blood. God did not want the temple to be built as a symbol of military might and achievement. He wanted to be built as a symbol of worship. Hallelujah. And there was an, an incongruity, if you will, uh, 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 inappropriateness and unsuitability for a man of war to build a temple of peace. There was something not good that David had to do to build this house. God's house was to be an abode of peace. It needed to be built and erected by a man of peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, because war destroys lives and the temple represented that which saves lives. So David was not the proper person to build the ark, to build the temple. Now whether we notice or perceive all the particulars behind this aspect of God's refusal, the principle is not hard to grasp. You see, and let me say this, listen carefully church. Not everybody is fit to serve, to serve in certain places of divine service. God's word is plain and clear on this. Some are rejected because of gender. Some are rejected because of certain failures and sins in their lives, while others are rejected in service because of physical reasons. No one with physical blemishes could have served in Israel's priesthood. And I want you to listen up, you ministers and preachers, hear me here now. If God did not tolerate physical blemishes in his priesthood, why do you think he was going to accommodate our failures and our moral failures? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We stand to represent God. And if he rejected physical failures in the Old Testament, what makes us think? How much more serious he takes our moral failures and, 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 and sins. Amen. So if you're going to stand behind this pulpit and proclaim God's word, make sure your life is right. Amen. Make sure your life is right so that he does not reject you for your moral and spiritual failures. Because there are problems, temptations, testimony, trust inadequacies, and other reasons why some people cannot be given certain tasks in God's vineyard. Hallelujah. So David was not the man to build a temple. Paul wasn't able to do much service in Jerusalem where he had terribly persecuted the Christians. Even though he would have given his life to minister to them, he could not do it. He couldn't do much work there. But because, hear me now, because a person is rejected, from one area of service does not eliminate you from every other area. Hallelujah. You may not be able to preach. You may not be able to pray. You may not be able to sing. You may not be able to lead worship. But there are other things you can do. Amen. While David could not build a temple, he certainly was able to do much to prepare for the building of the temple. And while Paul was not permitted to minister in Jerusalem. He certainly had plenty of work to do elsewhere. And you see, in God's great kingdom that is being established, there are many ways we can serve. Hallelujah. We can keep the door of the sanctuary. We can give a cup of cold water. We can feed the hungry. We can give to upkeep the church. We can visit the prisoners and the, and the, the homeless. Hallelujah. These are all services that are as much honored 
as having a place in service in the God, in the God, vineyard of God. So we should not fuss or protest over rejection from some areas of service. Rather, we should seek out where else we can serve. And do not think or complain that a rejection from some area of service makes you a lesser person than others. That kind of thinking only shows your rebellion and your pride. Instead, submit to God's place for your service, as David did here so commendably, even if that place is a more humble position than the one you desired. Because the most important thing to, with God is not achievement, it is attitude. Hallelujah. And it is not the wonder of our work, that, but the willingness of our heart that impresses God. Praise God. And you may have witnessed the death of your dream, or you have watched as life altered your plans. I ask you to take time. Look at all that the Lord has done through your life. And you will see that he has something far better in mind for you than you could have ever imagined for yourself. In 1912, Scotland, a family wanted to immigrate to the United States. Father, mother, nine children. And to do that, they scrimped and scraped and saved until they had enough to get their papers and everything was ready. And they booked their subscriptions on the ship and they were ready to leave. But as happens at times, tragedy struck one week before they were supposed to leave. One of the children, a little boy, the youngest, was bitten by a stray dog. It wasn't bad. The doctor got there, patched up the little young man, and in no time he was good. But the doctor left a little yellow sticker on the door. That sticker said that there was a possibility the little young man was, had become rabid because of the stray dog. Their ship was due to leave in one week. The family was quarantined for two weeks. They watched as their dreams were dashed. The ship would sail without them. And the father was so angry, he went down to the, to, the, to the pier and he watched as the ship left and sailed. And he was furious with God and he cursed and he stormed away from there. He went back home, a madman. One day later, he learned that the ship that was supposed to bring them to America to their dreams had sunk. The Titanic went down and took with it 1,500 passengers. The tragedy of their missing that ship turned out to be the triumph of their lives being spared. You don't know what God has in store for you. When your plan falls apart, God has something better for you. Hallelujah. And maybe you have watched your plans and your life shattered and broken. And you are wondering why God would refuse to allow you to see your dreams fulfilled. Maybe you are disappointed with the way your life has turned out. Let me challenge you to look at your life, church. You may not have gotten all you wanted in life, but hasn't God given you so much more? Did he not save you by his grace? Has he not used you and is still using you to accomplish his will in the world? Some of you have been privileged to raise preachers in your family. There is no greater honor than that. Some of you have been privileged to teach your children and now they are godly men and women. Some of you have saved, God has saved you from a lifetime of pain and misery by not allowing you to marry that person you wanted to marry. You thought you could not live without that person. But God said no. And he saved you from pain and misery. Hallelujah. Some of you, he did not allow you to buy that house that you thought you wanted so much that you couldn't do without it. See, when God says no to your dreams and your plans, it's because he has something far better for you. Amen. And this is what David discovered 
This was the experience of the disciples. They thought that their dreams were shattered when Jesus died on the cross. They soon found out that God had something better for them. He was going to use them to turn the world upside down. Praise God. Paul beseeched God to remove the thorn from his flesh, but he discovered that God's grace is more beneficial for him. And many others in scripture has received the same kind of experience. The Hebrew boys in the furnace, Daniel in the lion's den, Elijah at the dried up brook, the widow woman and the empty barrel, Naaman the leper, and so many more church. If we would just wait upon God and don't try to push through our own dream and plans, but let God work out his, his will in our lives. See, because the Lord's plan is always better. Hallelujah. But I want you to see also David's de devotion to God. In the closing verses of this, of, this, of this chapter, we see it. David, in verse 18, and I believe David's prayer and his attitude reveal to us what our response should be when our dreams are shattered. Notice what David did in verse 18. He went in and he sat before the Lord. In verse 20, like a little child, he referred to himself in the third person. He said, and what shall David say unto the Lord? In verse 18 again, he acknowledged the fact that he was unworthy for such a blessing. In verses 19 to 22, David praised the Lord for his blessings, his grace, and his wonderful love for his people. David, the mighty king, assumed a place of humility before the presence of the Lord. It was also a holy devotion. David's submission to God is summed up in the last verse, words of verse 25. He said, Lord, do as you have said. Yes. This do as you had said included the promises God has made to him for his dynasty, but it also included the refusal of him for him to build a temple. David, however, he saw the whole picture. <laughs> you see, when we give our plans to God and we sit in prayer and in humility before him and we ask him to reveal his will, he shows us the whole picture. He saw the whole picture. The promises and the refusal were all part of God's plan for David. And he was not looking to line veto any item. He would submit to everything God had said. And you see, that is not easy for us at some times. We will submit to the promises, but we don't want the denials. We will submit to the freedom, but we don't want the restrictions. We will submit to the honoring promises, but we don't want the humbling precepts. We will submit for our rights, but we don't want the responsibility. We will readily submit to the pleasures, but not the pain. We will submit to the comfort, but not the inconvenience. But if we want the promise, we must take the refusal also. Hallelujah. Because it is all part of God's plan. And even though David did not get his way in the matter, he was willing to accept the plan as God saw it. His words are filled with praise for the God that he loves. And unlike some people who pout and pine when they don't get their way, David just praised the Lord because he trusted God to know and to do what he is able to do. Yeah. Hallelujah. It was also an attitude of honorable devotion. David accepts God's promise and acknowledges God's ability to bring them all to pass. And in his prayer, David reveals the heart that Jesus revealed. He said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Hallelujah. That's what we need to say in our lives, church. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. No wonder David is called a man after God's old heart. What should our response be when God says no? Firstly, which we should remember who we are and what we have all comes to us because of God's perfect love and grace. Everything that we have, we didn't deserve it. God has in his grace has let it come to us. Remember that he is the potter. We are just the clay. We cannot tell him how to do it. He knows what the plans are. 
And we should assume that place of humility before his presence and trust him to do what he knows to do best. Our goal should not be to achieve our dreams, but we sh- our goal should be to see God's perfect will come to pass in our lives. Amen? So let me bring this to a close. David was not allowed to build the Lord's temple, but he was allowed to make preparations for the fulfillment of the dream. In 1 Chronicles chapter 2, David prepared all the materials necessary for the construction of the temple. In chapter 28, 1 Chronicles, David gives Solomon all the plans and the instructions necessary to fulfill the dream. So in the end, even though it didn't go as he planned, it was all good because he got to be a part of it. Hallelujah. He got to be a part of it. And sometimes you and I, we have to let our dreams go if we want to God to use us and to fulfill that perfect will in our Sometimes we have to let the dream fall apart so that God can do it. Sometimes we have to accept his no so that we can see God move. And when God says no, it will often come with blessed and compensating promises. So when God says no to you, do not look so much as what is refused. Rather, look for what is promised. Hallelujah. Look for what is promised. And maybe today you have some shattered dreams in your life. Maybe things have not turned out the way you thought they would. There may even be a measure of bitterness in your heart and that you did not get your way. But I believe God's lesson for us today is that if we would submit to his plan, God can take what we perceive as a broken dream and use it to bless our lives all in the process, making himself great, glorifying his name, lifting up his church, hallelujah, making sure that his people bless him and walk according to his plan for their lives. What do you do when God says no? Oh, don't pout and pine. Watch for his promises. Watch as he works it out for you. In the name of Jesus, thank you for listening. May God bless you and bring you to that place today.